So good to see everyone here tonight on Wednesday evening. Go ahead and take your song books and be marking as our invitation song 124. 124, that will be our invitation song. Rick Nichols will be leading us in that in just a moment. We have a number of announcements tonight, including our usual prayer list, and so I'll begin with it, but then we want to uh, emphasize some things coming up over the next couple of weeks, and so let's get right into our prayer list. As you know, we're, uh, we always want to try to remember Jeffrey and Highland Camp. Please keep them in your prayers. Sister Aline Grimes, as she is continuing rehab with her uh, recent surgery that she had, or the recent injury, rather, that she had. Uh, Brother Nathaniel Atkinson continues to do well, and we're grateful for that. Uh, Terry Young, we added Terry Young, I believe, the last uh, week or so. Sally Cheatwood, Belle Dover. Uh, Jonna Luker, we have Jonna with us tonight, and we're thrilled that she's able to be out, so it's good to have Jonna. Also, Nico Marler, we want to continue to remember her, and Judy Trammell, please continue uh, to remember her as well. Now, each week, be sure to pick up a bulletin, that way you can uh, have the fuller listing of all of our prayer needs, and you can keep up with it, hopefully, uh, even better using that tool. Now, tomorrow, Brother Mike Benson, we announced, I believe it was just last Wednesday night, we announced that he needed to be scheduled for emergency surgery. And uh, we are thankful that now he's on the books. He will be having his gallbladder removed tomorrow. Uh, he's scheduled for 12 noon tomorrow on Thursday. So that, that is good news. Which hospital will that be at, Mike? Okay, Surgery Center in Oxford. So uh, let's be praying for Mike tonight and tomorrow as he has that surgery upcoming. Now, as you know, this is a big weekend we have coming up. This is our fifth Sunday of the fourth quarter. So what that means is it's our annual uh, Gospel Broadcasting Network Contribution Sunday. Uh, Brother Joey Treat is going to be with us from GBN, and he's going to be making the presentation during a Bible class on Sunday morning, and then he will be preaching as well on Sunday morning. Not sure yet if he's uh, preaching in, um, in the afternoon or if he'll be getting back on the road, and so I'm still not sure about that. Uh, but he, uh, Joey Treat, will be with us. Now, that means, of course, that all of our contribution taken in this coming Lord's Day uh, will go directly to GBN. Uh, that won't affect how you make out your checks or anything. You can continue to make out your contribution checks to the Ironiton Church of Christ. And what our elders plan on doing, as usual, is they will simply... Uh, total up the contributions from the day Sunday, and then we'll write a single check to GBN. So that's coming up. We need to be uh, praying about that, and also hopefully we've already been planning and purposing toward that end. And that also means in connection with GBN Sunday that we'll be having a congregational fellowship meal. And so that will be following the morning worship hour, of course, next door. Uh, we plan to have a big meal and a big group, hopefully, and so let's be planning uh, all of this for Sunday coming up here in about four days. Now, the following weekend, Saturday evening, November 4th, is going to be the annual hayride bonfire, uh, uh, assuming that we'll be able to have a bonfire, I think we will, uh, bonfire and hayride at the Harris's. On uh, Saturday, November 4th, uh, we continue to mention the sign-up sheets. There are two. 
We would like for you to sign one just to let us know that you're planning on coming and who all will be or the number that will be in your family's party. If you would, let us know. Uh, you might just write that in parentheses or something beside your name. But then the other sign-up sheet is for food. And so if you'd like to bring something, please sign up the other sheet as well and uh, just indicate what maybe what you might be bringing or it may be laid out. You'll see it on the sheet. Uh, but let's be planning for that Saturday, November 4th. Uh, is the start time 5? Five? 5. Start time's at 5 in the afternoon or early evening. Is that also time change weekend? Okay. So that will still be old time on Saturday, but the next morning, Lord willing, uh, we'll be falling back and our clocks will need to change for Sunday, November 5th. So we'll keep that in mind. Now, regarding the hayride and the bonfire, remember that we like to use that as an opportunity to uh, introduce uh, newcomers to the congregation here at Ironiton. And so what that means is we'd love for you to invite and bring neighbors, co-workers, friends, family members. Uh, there's no reason why we cannot make this a push uh, to be an aid in evangelism. And so we'd love to have visitors come to the hayride on that Saturday night. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, those are all of the announcements I have before me. Don't think I'm overlooking anything, Jonna. Okay, Sister uh, Shirley Sadler, she dropped something on her foot earlier today. Let me add her name right here. So let's remember Sister Shirley in our prayers. Oh, yes, <laughs> almost forgot this too. Um, David Stafford is the gospel preacher at the Piedmont Congregation. And just in the last few days, uh, he and his family, they lost their home in a house fire. And not only their home, but when it burned, they lost at least two of their vehicles. Uh, maybe their only two, I'm not sure, but... Anyway, a very devastating uh, disaster there in Piedmont. And so please be praying for the Stafford family. I know that uh, our elders here, they're already at work in seeing to it that we get them some help. But I, I know that they need our prayers. And so that is the Stafford family in Piedmont. The Cobbler family? Okay. okay. Yes, the Cobbler family in Scottsboro, they had their first grandson yesterday, but he had to go to the Nick unit in Huntsville with low oxygen. Um, and the mother has not been released from the hospital yet either. So is the baby still in the Nick unit right now? Okay, so remember both mother and uh, baby, the cobbler, like, like a peach cobbler, the cobbler family in Scottsboro, they, they've requested our prayers. All right, yes, Rodney? Okay, <laughs> all right, name brand stuff is what we're told here. So the Cokes, Dr. Peppers, uh, Sprites, just we, we're going to need some two liter drinks. And so if you don't mind bringing those things for our meal Sunday. Come on up here, Rick. I'm about to offer the invitation. Anything else? All right, let's open our Bibles to Titus chapter 2 for just a moment. Titus chapter 2. Our young men and the young men's training class that uh, meets tonight, of course, next door. Uh, for some time now, they have been in the book of Titus. And I want our thoughts tonight to stem from Titus 2 
as we offer the Lord's invitation. Let's begin at verse 11, Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, as an evangelist, notice what Titus was told to do with this information. Verse 15, the last verse of the chapter. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You know, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, the Hebrews writer asked, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The salvation that you and I have as members of the Lord's church is great salvation. And here is an example passage, one of sundry passages that could be consulted from the New Testament that really brings out the greatness of of this salvation. Let's just hit some high points as we move through these four or five verses. First of all, in verse 11, there are two key considerations from verse 11 regarding our salvation. The first one is the source, and the second consideration is the scope. Notice that the source of our salvation is the grace of God. Were it not for the favor of God, salvation would be hopeless. Salvation would be impossible for man were it not for the grace, that is, the favor of God toward man. That's the source of salvation. Now secondly, notice from verse 11, the scope. The scope of our salvation is all men. Now, that's not saying that all men will be saved. In fact, Jesus tells us uh, quite differently from that, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. But it does tell us that the grace of God hath appeared. The grace of God is available unto all men. And so from verse 11, notice the scope and notice the source of our salvation. And then in verse 12, isn't it interesting that we read those three adverbs consecutively? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Many a gospel preacher through the years has pointed out that these three terms well summarize having a right mindset, number one, toward self, living soberly, living a self-controlled life with the proper attitude and the proper mindsets. Number two, living a proper life toward our fellow man, righteously, being righteous and fair and equitable in our dealings with others. And then finally, number three, living our lives in a proper mindset toward God, living godly, that is, with a God-consciousness a God-awareness, a God-fearing attitude, soberly, righteously, and then godly. Next, move down to verse 13. And for a high point in verse 13, notice this potential statement. Seemingly, I believe it is a statement, attesting the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God the great God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if both of those terms apply to Jesus Christ, as they appear to do in our text, well then this is another great statement, yet another one, attesting truly that Jesus is God. He is deity. And then in verse 14, when we come down to verse 14, look at the powerful verbs that are used in verse 14. And they're all used 
uh, in connection with our Lord Jesus Christ. Three powerful verbs. Number one, He gave Himself for us. Number two, that He might redeem us from all iniquity. And number three, purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know, it's interesting, and in fact, this really helps to demonstrate for us what the grace of God is and what the grace of God entails. We know back from verse 11 that our salvation is by the grace of God. We're saved by grace. That is the source of our salvation. Well, what does that entail on God's part? Well, it entails Jesus giving Himself for us, redeeming us and purifying us unto himself. And so three powerful verbs all right there in verse 14. And so no wonder then when we read verse 11 and notice some high points, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, these verses are so rich with content that we're simply hitting high points in each one, but in light of these, no wonder then that in verse 15, Paul urges Titus, these things speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no man set thee at naught. Let no man despise thee. And so, friend, tonight we offer this invitation, this salvation that we read about from Titus 2, 11 through 14, secured by the grace of God, uh, powerful to the changing and transformation of lives, this salvation can be yours. Why not tonight believe on our Lord Jesus Christ, turn in repentance from the practice of error and sin, confess His name, and tonight put Him on. Put Jesus on in baptism in order to have your sins washed away by His precious blood. According to Acts 2, those who obey that and no other message but that message the Lord adds them to His body, the church. Acts 2.47, the churches of Christ, Romans 16.16, 16, wherever they meet the world over, and you tonight can be a Christian. Nothing more. You don't have to wear any other designation or hyphenation or any of that stuff. Just be a Christian, a member of His church, and you tonight can be saved. We would love to help you do that. Brother or sister, if you've done those things, but tonight you need to make amends in your life, and it, they need to be of a public nature because they are publicly known and they have been a public detriment to the work of the church, then we would love to pray with you and for you tonight as you confess sin. The Bible assures us that God forgives. And so if we can help you, please come as we stand and as we sing.
Shorty on. Thank you. Funny when you're sick and you have anticipatory surgery and somebody tells you about how terrible they had it. So Take a moment and think about how time and the concept of time impacts your day. Unless you're retired, um, you probably set your phone or your clock for a specific time to wake up this morning. Maybe you hit snooze and then you got up and you started preparing yourself for the day. You looked at your watch to make sure that you were on time, you did your best to get to work on time, then the next time you're looking at your watch, you're thinking about perhaps like me, when is the break? When is lunch time? When is the time that you get off? And throughout the day, we are very conscious of, we're keenly aware of T-I-M-E, our schedules, our, our planning, our uh, are dedicated to that reality. And perhaps you have, or maybe on the other hand, you've not thought about the subject, and I want to challenge us. The GM is out of town uh, this week, and he has asked me to cover for him. I'm currently preaching on Sundays at the Collinsville Church of Christ. been there about a year and a half, and for the past six weeks, I've been talking about this particular subject in our Sunday morning Bible class. And so I'm going to give you some snippets of what I've been able to teach. I hope that you brought your Bible with you. Uh, I have a tendency to mark in my Bible these passages uh, because I, I want to come back and, and uh, rehearse those into my thinking. If you have a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to entertain that as best that I can. And I may even ask a few folks to, to read out loud if, if, you, if you don't mind. These are questions that I have written down and I've transferred them to the PowerPoint. And as uh, we think about the subject, I hope that you'll prayerfully consider the concept of redeeming the time. It, it's, it, it's, it's appropriate to ask when did time begin? And if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, we actually have an answer to that question. Genesis chapter 1, and I've highlighted some key phrases that I've marked in my Bible. Genesis 1 and verse 1, we probably can quote together, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you drop down from verse 1 to verse 5... Uh, you'll notice here, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning, watch it, were the first day. The first day, and then you read the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth, and finally the sixth day. Now, let me just make this point here. Whenever the Hebrew word for day, which in this case is Y-O-M, Yom. Whenever the Hebrew word for day, Yom, is used in the Old Testament outside of prophetic literature, outside of prophetic literature, whenever it's used, it is always used in a literal fashion. I had the opportunity to teach the young men's Bible class, and I'm studying the same subject, but then a couple of weeks ago when Cliff was out of town, and I brought to the attention of the boys that the typical atheist evolutionist believes that the earth 
is 4.5 billion, with the B, billion years old, and that mankind is a relative newcomer that he started, if you please, in the evolutionary process about 300,000 years ago. Well, I've mentioned Matthew chapter 19, that should be Matthew 19 and verse 5. I just caught that. Be that as it may, you remember Jesus has been cornered by the religious leaders of the day, and they're asking him about the subject of marriage and divorce. And Jesus said, have you not read, listen, have you not read that he who, listen, made them at the beginning? Well, if man uh, showed up on the evolutionary chain 300,000 years ago, he clearly was not at the beginning. Well, when did time begin? Well, we're told day one, day two, day three, all the way down to, uh, to day six, and man was created on the sixth yom, the sixth day. Why is it, this is just something for you free to think about, why is it that uh, mankind in general has a, has a tendency to view science through man's eyes and to discard the word of God when in reality we have the answer to, we ought to be looking at God's word first. So when we think about time, we're told specifically there is the first day, the second day, and those days were literal 24-hour periods as we know them. Now, the best commentary on the Bible is, ex is the Bible itself. And if you go to Exodus 20, at a verse 20, uh, verse 11 rather, when Moses, as I recall, is giving the Ten Commandments, notice what Moses, through inspiration, said, For in six days... The Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Now, by the way, we would be told that the days in Scripture are actually long eons, vast evolutionary periods of time. If a day was eons of time, pray tell what was a month or what was a year. So I know what the Bible says, and the Bible is accurate. Genesis 1 and verse 14 we're still in the first chapter of the Bible. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide, watch it, the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. And if days are vast evolutionary periods of time, pray tell, what are months and years? Clearly, time had its beginning, its initiation on day one of creation started by God. Now, that's a pretty profound thought if you start thinking about it. Number one, God started time at the beginning of Earth's history. Now, that brings a deeper question, and one that deserves our, uh, our personal reflection. Well, if time began at the beginning, well, when exactly did God exist? Psalm 90 and verse 2, if you'll cross-reference Genesis 1 to Psalm 90, and notice what the psalmist said. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you, God, had formed the earth and the world, watch it, before you had formed the earth, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So if you start at the beginning and go backwards... Before time, God has always existed. I, I, I don't like using this word. I, I, there's got to be something better than this. But, but here's the point. How long, how long did God exist? Well, there's never... The moment we use that kind of language, we, we betray ourselves because God always has been. God exists outside of time. Now, let me ask you this question, since it just came to my mind. Uh, are, 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 you, are, are you eternal? Hello? It's not a hard question. Okay. You're mortal, but do you possess something that is eternal? Eternal, yes. What's the difference between eternal God and your eternal soul? What's the difference? Your soul has an initiation from the time you were conceived in your mother's womb. God somehow presses that eternal soul within you. And that eternal soul continues. 
Doesn't have an end. But God always has been. He exists outside of the parameters and the boundaries of time. Two verses later, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past and like a watch in the night. Isaiah 40 at verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard, now watch this phrase, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. I want you to notice how Isaiah described him as the everlasting God. But if you back up here, he is from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 102 to verse 12, but you, O Lord, shall endure forever. And there's a host of other passages. All right, we're building a case today in Bible class. Number one, Time was God's idea. God initiated it at the beginning of creation on day one. There were days. And then on day four, we've got the sun, moon, and the stars that come along. So God is eternal, number two, and he exists outside of time. He is not governed by time. He doesn't get old because he's always been. Now, one of the ways that is helpful to me in preaching and teaching and in Bible class, and I, and I say this as no reflection on you, but my favorite age group to te teach is fourth graders. And, and, and I try to get it down on a fourth grade level, and I want to give an analogy, if I could, to help us remember the concept of God being eternal and, and outside of time, and, and, and hopefully this will help you to, to think about it. There is on-the-clock time. Imagine, imagine you're a school teacher. For some of us uh, um, who own their own business, you punch a clock. Let's say you're a school teacher and you have to be in at 6:30, and so you punch a clock. Perhaps it's a digital one. You're on site there for an eight-hour period. You're paid by the hour, typically. You're paid, you know, at the end of a week or a couple of weeks, and it, it typically involves a regular schedule. Now, there might be a school teacher here. When the school teacher is done, let's say at 3.30, let's say she's done at 3.30. Is she done with her schoolwork? She's going to go home. What is she going to do? She fixes dinner for the kiddos. Then what else? She's going to start grading papers. She's planning for the future. And so there is on the clock time where she is working. They're getting paid for those hours. There's on the clock time, but there's off the clock time. She's not on the clock. She's not receiving pay. It's every evening. She's planning. She's preparing. And it's, you know, it's obviously less uh, structured because you didn't have children. Well, here's the point. God's always been off the clock. God started time, but he exists outside of it. He's not governed by it. He is aware of it. We'll talk about that. Man exists on the clock. Somebody's got a Bible. Read for me. Psalm 90. Psalm 90, we've referred to it twice already. Verse 2, verse 4. Psalm 90 and verse 10. Days of our years, are, and you're reading from the old King James, John is reading, it says three score and ten, which would be about 70 years. The average lifespan for an individual, the average lifespan, at least at that particular time, was 70 years, and then there are 80-year-olds, but you don't know a lot of 100-year-old folks. I know of one or two, but you and I exist within linear time. Now, when I say linear, don't let that word scare you. It just means this. Think of dominoes. 
that you would line up in a straight line and you push one over and what happens? It pushes all the other ones over. Okay? And that's, what, that's, that's what happens to us. Uh, our, our life begins and uh, they are experienced sequentially in a linear fashion despite what Star Trek or any other TV show would tell you to the, op to the, uh, uh, to the opposite. We can't go back in time. Wish we could. Be nice, wouldn't it? Oh, to be 20 years old again. But they, they go forward in linear fashion. You and I are, are living on, on the clock time, but God lives outside of it, therefore he is off the clock. Now, having said that, he sent his son to live within the confines of time for a short time, 30 some odd years. Ironically, it was he himself who said in John chapter 9, I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And Jesus realized that there were limitations to his day. And by the way, Jesus ever get tired? Shake your head this way. Got in the boat, sleepy, tired. His body was governed at that particular point by that reality. As I've already said, God exists outside the constraints of time. He's off the clock. He existed before time. He exists outside of time, and he'll always exist after he decides to end it. Now watch it. He began it in Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at a few verses of Scripture together. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. And we'll mark these three passages, tie them together. So I get to Peter 3 to verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. God, God will say, okay, this is the last day. Time's going to come to an end. It'll come to a cessation. The day of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. We'll try to harmonize all these together. Speaking of the end of time, Jesus admitted while he was on earth, but of that day, back up to verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Verse 36, but of that day, singular, and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. God has preordained a day. Go with me finally to Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Back up to verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he, God, has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. God exists out of time. He started it. He's going to finish it. He'll say, this is it. This is the last day. Could be today. And he'll judge the world. The earth will be burned up. When did it start? It started at the beginning. Who started it? God. How could he do that? Well, he's timeless. He's always existed. He spoke it into existence. Now, uh, I, I like to use this illustration when I'm talking about the subject. We'll just use this piece of paper as an illustration. But imagine that we have the beginning at creation and we have the end of the world here on the same page. This is what God is able to do. He's able to look at time backwards and forwards. One of the things that I love about Old Testament prophecy is when you, when you read of, uh, of what a prophet says 800 years before the fact, he speaks of it in the present or in the past tense. How could he do that? Well, in God's mind, it's already occurred. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10 God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. He's able to see it. He's able to see it all. He is 
omniscient. He is omnipotent. Now, here's a question that perhaps you have thought about as we've started our class. Why would a self-existent, all-powerful, timeless God be interested in time in the first place? Well, two or three reasons, and this doesn't exhaust it. Number one, in his eternal mind, God knew that humanity would live within the boundaries of time. He created us to live in this. And as we've already pointed out, God's going to send his son temporarily to live as an example inside the parameters of time. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, and by the way, I, I, I'm enjoying uh, our Wednesday night Bible class. Jim, you know, emphasizes in the point that, that I hear often in the book of Mark is immediately. Jesus understood there was a sense of, emergen of uh, urgency in what was happening. And you and I possess an eternal soul that is eventually going to live outside of time. When God says, I'm finished, when God says the world is over, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own what? His own soul. Well, why is that such an important thing? Because that soul is eternal. And when God stops the clock, then we begin to dwell in eternity. I've had a fear as I've been preparing the class and as I'm preaching in Collinsville and I wanted to communicate here that my purpose in the study is not simply because you and I might have this intellectual idea, rightfully so, because God communicates it in the Bible, that he initiated it, that you and I live within time and that then eventually we all die. And so we're to use our time wisely. I can't control time, by the way. I can control myself. But, but there's, a, there's a deeper application to this. See, this was my concern. My concern is that you walk away and say, well, that's, that's an interesting thought. But if you and I live inside the parameters of time, if we exist within it, then one of the questions we have to ask is, is God, do you care? And as I'm reading the book of Psalms, I often hear this idea, and, and other passages in the Bible, by the way, where people, brethren, say, oh, Lord, what? Oh, Lord, how long? How long am I going to suffer? Well, uh, children of Israel were in, uh, in Egypt 430 years. Uh, Moses lived for 40 years, killed an Egyptian taskmaster. He thought, you know what? Now it's time for me to step up and to be the deliverer. And God says, um, no, let's wait another 40 years when you're 80 and then I'll start you. And what did he do for 40 years? Tended sheep. John chapter 9 Jesus comes up on a familiar scene. A man is at this regular spot every day. And the disciples asked him, uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? He's never seen green grass. He's never seen the blue sky. He's never seen the face of his family. He's been blind. How long? Was God aware of that? Mm-hmm. A uh, woman in Mark chapter 5, we haven't got there quite yet, have we, on Wednesday night? A woman in Mark chapter 5 has been suffering for 12 years. By the way, Jairus' daughter is 12 years old, and she's dying. And Jairus comes and says, uh, Lord, look, look, can you get in the ambulance and let's rush over to the house because my daughter is dying. And so Jesus starts to go walking with him in the ambulance, and then the woman 
the woman who has had the, uh, the flow of blood sees Jesus, knows of Jesus and his power, and she thinks, if I can just touch the hem, the tassels, and she's down reaching behind him, and she reaches out, and Jesus feels the power emanating out of him. Has he got any less power than he did? No, he felt the experience. Who touched me? Well, he's surrounded by all kind of folks. They're elbow to elbow, and finally she comes clean. Now, if I'm Jairus, I'm the father of the child that's dying, I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. This woman's had, she's been sick 12 years. Wing, wing, wing. Lord just put her in the, uh, in the waiting room. She's waited this long. And then somebody comes up and says, don't even talk to Jesus anymore because the girl's dead. And then Jesus goes and resurrects her from the dead. The man in in John chapter 5, has been suffering for 38 years. God started time. God is aware of time. God knows that you are suffering within time. And here's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. You know what? You, can, you can't compare. You can't compare what's happening today with the joy of what it's going to be like in eternity in heaven. You can't compare. One of the reasons it can't compare is why. Because it's not even a speck on the clock compared to eternity and the joy. And there'll be no sadness there and no pain and no tears and no crying. Questions, observations so far? Okay. Why, do think, why do you think those verses are so easily overlooked when they're so very straightforward? Well, you know, I hadn't thought about it in the context of what's happening in the world, but the whole idea of pre-millennialism. Now, millennial means what? Anybody know? Thousand, Thousand years. Well, pre Millennial means stuff that's going to happen before. Now, premillennialists, I say this respectfully, spend an awful lot of time watching the clock. Okay? And they would agree, they would agree the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And if you'll pay attention to what they're saying online, and I do, they would say, we don't know when exactly he's coming, but we know this, that certain things have to, ha have to happen first before he comes. Now, uh, uh, in, in some instances, yeah, the, uh, in, in, yeah, if you have, John's made an excellent point, uh, if you forget in Matthew's context, Matthew 24's context, that the destruction that he's talking about there is not the end of the world in the first part of the chapter, but in the first chart of the part of the chapter he's actually talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which has already occurred in AD 70. So I, 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 you know, why are people blinded? Probably many times because they choose to be, would be an honest answer. Right, and so when they look at that part of the world and they've interpreted, they've interpreted Revelation through the eyes of, uh, of their predisposition and, and their doctrinal stance, they can, they, rather than saying here's what the Bible says, is they create the doctrine and then fit the verses into that doctrine to make it say what it says. Uh, what's interesting is the premillennialist says 
that at the next coming, the earth is going to, Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Uh, by the way, God forbid that this should happen, but if somebody dropped a nuclear bomb on the city of Jerusalem, how could Jesus set up a kingdom for a thousand years? I don't want that to happen, obviously. It'd be a lot of death. But that would destroy the premillennial you know, ideology because it would blow their doctrine out of, the, out of the water. Good questions. Now, you ready for this? This is probably my favorite part of the lesson. Let's look at a verse. Look with me in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Cliff is studying 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus in Paul's words to these young evangelists, and uh, he used that as an example. In fact, he was in Titus tonight. And as I was writing the lesson about, oh, a month ago, I guess it was, I was thinking about this verse, and I noticed something. Let's begin at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Now watch verse 2. In hope, in hope of eternal life, which God, we've been talking about God, who cannot lie, how many lies has God told? He hadn't told any. He can't do it. Not that he won't. He can't do it because God is truth. Now watch it. In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. Now watch this. Promised before time began. Now here's what I did the first time I, here's what I did the first time that I started thinking about this. I thought, wait a minute. God made a promise before time began. Well, if God is eternal, and then time began, and then time's going to end, but if God, who is eternal, made a promise before time began, at what point before time began did he do it? When did he make the promise? Well, God's mind is eternal. His is an eternal mind. It's always existed. Now, listen to listen just how mind-blowing this is. In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before, he promised you eternal life where? Before time began. When has God not been thinking about your eternal soul? Never. God has always been thinking about how you and I can be saved. That's always been on his mind. And how is he going to do that? Through the sending of his son and the establishment of the church. Let's look at Ephesians 1 and verse 4. See, we're, 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 we're bound by the clock. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. All right, there would be those who would suggest that you were chosen arbitrarily and that God, before he initiated the world, did this. You, you, and you, and you, and you will be saved, and you, you, and you, and you will be lost. But the idea here is this. He chose a type of person to be saved. Who did he choose to be saved according to the passage? Those who are in him. And how do we get in him? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, wait a minute. He chose you when? Before the foundation of the world. How long has he been thinking about this? Well, in his eternal mind, he's always been thinking about you. Before the world began, God knew that he was going to start the world. He knew that he was going to... Uh, 
you know, he didn't wake up and say, man, that caught me off guard. I didn't know that was going to happen. Let me think about that. No, he's, he's always been thinking about your salvation. He's always thinking about how he was going to and when he was going to send his son. He's always thought about the church. He chose those who would be in him to be saved. And I, wrote, I found one, two, three, four, five, six, or, okay, let's, if we don't count the passages in John chapter 17, he promised, he foreordained, he chose, he predetermined, he purposed. What's that? Five passages that tell me what God was doing before the foundation of the world, before time began. He was active. How could he, how could he be active? Because he's not bound by this. Observations, questions. Hope I whetted your appetite a little bit. I think that's my last slide. That is. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your power. Thank you for loving us, caring for us, and sending your eternal son to come here to die on our behalf. Help us, Father, to realize the fleeting nature of time and that it is a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away, and to use our time accordingly. In Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen.